Okay, so thank you everyone. Welcome to PCDN's latest webinar in the future of work and social change with Paul Breloff, who is the founder of Shortlist Hires. It's a very innovative tech startup that is based in Mumbai, India, and it's helping to radically change how talent is recruited and hired in the social impact sector. Um, and Paul has a long history of innovation, working in social change and impact investing. He worked for Axio and Venture Labs, and he has um, a law degree from Yale University, a BA, you know, amazing experience around the world. And you know, he's one of the leading thinkers and doers, um, really thinking about the nature of talent, um, how do we help harness human capital, and really, you know, as we get into the age of machine learning, automation, how do we actually make hiring more humane and more pleasant, which is one of the challenges in the world. Um, how, so how do we go beyond kind of the mass getting hundreds of resumes and applications for job openings? And that doesn't often lead to the best candidate. It leads to a lot of frustration in both the hiring and the candidate side. So we're delighted that you've taken time to share your wisdom with us today. Um, while, before we get started with Paul, say this occasionally we're using the Zoom platform, but anytime you can hit the chat button, you should be able to see it at the bottom of your screen. If you are on a computer, if you're calling on a phone, let us know. And, you can put in your question, where you're calling in from or zooming in from, you know, and, and we, want, we want this to be a very interactive session. So at any time, feel free to ask questions and if, you know, we'll make sure we cover it at some point during the session, if not immediately. And you know, we'd, we'd really like to hear like you're calling in from Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe, but, but let's hear your questions. Um, and so I'll turn it over to you, Paul. We're gonna start off with a series of questions just to you know, understand the innovative work that you're doing, how this connects with some of the future work in social change in general. Um, so, so the first just main question is, how is recruiting talent in the social sector changing in the global south? Okay. Did you hear the question? Mm -hmm. you just can, sorry, can you repeat yeah. it? I lost you halfway yeah. through. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so how is the nature of recruiting in the social sector changing in the global south? Yeah, no, and, and thanks for thanks for having me here, Craig. Uh, great to speak with all of you. Because we are such a small group, I'm hoping you'll all speak up and can take this conversation wherever um, you want. Um, as Craig mentioned, uh, my background has mostly been in financial inclusion, but I've been in this social enterprise and uh, impact investing world for quite some time. Um, happy to kind of take this conversation where it goes. My interest has really been focused on recruiting, hiring, and how companies build teams in the last uh, several years. Uh, even before my current uh, startup was shortlist, I think my passion was always around how do how do companies build great teams? What separates one team from another? Um, and the opportunity to try to use technology to help improve how companies do that was part of the motivating impulse behind Shortlist. In terms of how recruiting's um, um, changing, um, I think the, the the trends I would probably respond with are the ones that don't necessarily just impact uh, social change org organizations or social organizations, but are impacting really every everyone everywhere. Um, um, obviously, I think uh, particularly in, uh, in emerging markets, um, we have incredibly young populations that are entering the workforce. We primarily work in India and, and uh, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, both very young markets. There's a million people a month joining the workforce in India. Um, that's a, just a stunning number if you think about it. And there's more people joining the workforce in Sub-Saharan Africa than the rest of the world combined uh, in the next 10 years. That includes China and India. Um, so a big explosion of young people entering the workforce, a concern about whether there's going to be jobs to meet those uh, uh, young people entering the workforce, um, and a kind of changing structure of, of what work even means. I think that uh, the gigification and the way in which um, work's kind of becoming more short term is, is, is changing a lot. That presents opportunities, but also scary. Um, I think the, 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 the way in which uh, machines are coming in or aren't coming in or, or what have you is, is changing things. Um, um, and the way that young people expect something different from their careers is, is changing, which I love. I love to see that there's more focus on impact and purpose. Um, and so I think that's changing. Um, overall, um, 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 a lot of different forces at work, and I can get into sort of how shortlist plays into some of those, um, but uh, uh, um, a lot's happening. Overall, though, I think it's a, a thrilling time for the social space where a lot of uh, very talented young professionals. 
I think we had our in, and looking for years with uh, with purpose. Um, but I think that uh, uh, it's really an opportunity uh, uh, across the board, particularly for people looking to get into this space for the first time. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. And people are starting to let us know where they're watching from. So, so far, we have Georgetown University, where I am today, Trinidad and <laughs> Tobago, San Diego. Paul, you're in New York. And we've got other people. Please let us know where you're calling in from. Anytime, feel free to put in your questions. I also forgot to say, Paul is very generous and serves on our, in, in many ways, but also serves on our career advisory board. So he offers his input on a periodic basis, helping answer the questions you all have on building a career of impact. We've got an Amani fellow from India. So Anjan, welcome. It's great to have you here. Great. Um, so Paul, one question you mentioned, a million young people a month are entering the workforce in India. And you, know, you talked at the global level, like we're not sure there's going to be enough jobs for these people. You know, in the ILO, a couple of years ago, came out <clears> with a stat saying we need to create 600 million new jobs in the next 10 years just to keep youth unemployment where it is. Yeah. So whether you're talking about India or in general, like, are there enough jobs for the people who are entering the marketplace or is there the, the supply side is much greater than the demand side? It's, it's a great question. I think probably pro short answer is probably there's not enough jobs today. Uh, and I'm sure all the research points um, in that direction. And it's frankly the side of the equation that um, I and my fellow startups and entrepreneurs have a harder time addressing. I think there's been more activity happening on the, the uh, uh, I guess, labor supply side of uh, how do we make sure that people have the skills they need for the modern workforce and what employers are looking for? How do we make sure that people are then found and placed based on things that matter, uh, such as ability and competency, rather than just where you went to school or, or even worse, different forms of bias and things like that. So a lot of focus right now on the entrepreneurial and tech side to the, the, uh, the, the labor supply side. On the labor demand or the employer or the job creation, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I know that there's a lot of work being done and thought about at the policy side, future of work, uh, um, thematic areas. Um, um, one of the angles that I know I'm most interested in, but I admit it's complicated, is the idea of not just waiting for jobs to come in from big companies. And I think that you know, there, that's often where we start. Um, oh, these industries need to grow and they need to create more jobs and there needs to be more foreign direct investment. I do think that what we probably need to see a lot more of is entrepreneurship and a more robust um, small and medium enterprise market um, growing up, creating more jobs. And, and it, it sounds, it sounds uh, uh, it's, it's got problems, but trying to find more people that can go out there and just create the companies and create their own opportunities. Um, you know, my background was, as I mentioned, in microfinance. Microfinance has a lot of problems, but um, it also had some good ideas in the sense that it recognized that not everyone was going to be able to have a full-time job. That could be the ideal, but that we also can look at other ways and tools to give people the means to create their own income, um, even if it's small income streams across different areas, um, 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 that's a possibility. So I think there's work being done at a big level to bring in more jobs, tax policies, incentives, things like that. I think we also need to promote and encourage more entrepreneurship, more, more, more livelihood development, all of those angles as well. Okay. I'm wonderful. So we've got a few more people letting us know where they're from. So Christine, who helps run career services at Villanova. So great to have you here. We love having career center advisors. And I don't think we have anybody so far from Africa or Latin America, but let us know where you're watching from and you know, why you're introducing yourself. Please put your questions there because we want to get this as relevant as possible for you. And so Paul, can you talk a little bit about how in the world did you decide to start Shortlist? Where did the idea come from? And what problem are you solving both on the, the kind of applicant end and for the employer end? Yeah. So. I've had, a, I've had a kind of varied career, uh, as I mentioned, and for anyone who's out there looking at opportunities in this space, um, hopefully you could take some comfort knowing there's lots of ways to get, get into it, and I, I feel like I've tried all of them. Um, I was in advertising, I was a corporate lawyer, but then eventually came into microfinance, then set up an impact investing fund where I was investing in startups in the financial inclusion uh, um, realm. It was in my investing work that I became very interested in the challenges that companies were facing hiring people. Um, I would, and the same is true of my co-founder who was investing in clean energy enterprises. Both of us kind of recognized around the same time that after we handed companies money, 
their biggest problem usually was where do I get the people to grow these teams? And their inability to hire was often the limiting factor to their growth. So in this very specific way, we identified this issue that we knew technology and data could help address. Um, and we also knew it connected to a bigger passion that we both shared around how teams function, how to help people get the most out of their careers, how to unlock more professional potential uh, in, in the markets that we work in. Um, but very specifically, it started with these problem statements of how can we use tech and data to improve the efficiency of hiring? And so with that, how do we get past these manual intensive processes of posting jobs to job boards, reviewing big spot piles of CVs, uh, calling people to fill in the gaps, that felt like it was the wrong approach. And particularly in the 21st century, when you have these tech tools that can automate things. More importantly, we wanted to use tech and data to improve the quality of hiring. And specifically, how can we get past the CV, get past the LinkedIn profile to assess what really matters? I think we think that that is more fair and a more bias-free way to recruit. We also, frankly, think it's an imperative if you want to find enough people to grow with. Because in these markets, it's not often the case that you can rely on people to have gone to all fancy schools, worked at fancy companies. So you've got to find tools to tap into the hidden talent that exists in this market. By hidden talent, I mean talent that can do the job, that can show up, be great at, be great in the roles that you're looking to hire, but just don't present on day one with the resumes that you would normally expect to uh, uh, fill, fill those positions. So it makes you get a little bit creative with your hiring approach. Um, I think on a personal side also, uh, I, was, I was, had been doing investing for several years, love investing, might do it again some point in my career, but felt the need to get my hands dirty again. I had been in a dirty hands role in a microfinance institution, very operating heavy, learning a lot. I, I felt I had drifted pretty far away from that. And so wanted to have the professional challenge again of uh, building a business, um, specifically a business in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. I wanted to live again in those markets. Even though I'm speaking today from New York, um, I just landed a couple of nights ago from India where I actually live. And I more or less split my time between India and Kenya um, at present. And so felt like it was a, it was a great uh, moment in my career and life to, to do that. And the stars aligned and, and my co-founder Simon and I, uh, and, and third co-founder Matt, all decided to, to take the entrepreneurial leap. Wonderful. Um, so one question, you know, so you, you have a lot of social sector employers who are starting to use you, like the Good Food Institute or Acumen or you know, all sorts of, and so can you talk about, you know, the traditional way of applying is basically throwing spaghetti at the wall. So you put up a posting and you get all these resumes thrown at you and you might get, an employer might get between 300 to 1,000 applications or more. They've got to sift through it, huge time waste. 90% <clears throat> of the applications aren't good. And even the ones that are, as you're saying, people are looking at credentials rather than kind of competency. Yeah. So talk about like, how does the process work on, how are you helping employers like to, filter out and learn based on competencies? Like, so, so take, take an opening you help an employer recruit for, and how do, how do you test for the things? Because you know, in the tech, center, yeah. tech sector, that's increasingly happening. They can give someone a coding exam or a data visualization, but in the social sector, like, what are you testing for? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, because I think we identified pretty early that ideally we would find a way to use tech to get past the CV. What the heck does that mean? And how do you actually uh, do that? For us, what we have built is a technology platform that makes it very easy to customize a digital job application. We think of these like digital obstacle courses um, that, that candidates will go through. And so based on understanding what the role actually is, and, and I'll say we, we, we have had a big focus on social sector organizations because that's where my and my co-founder's passion lies, and that's where our personal networks lie. So that's where we got started. But the process that we would employ for a social sector organization or a mainstream company is, is, is very similar and may just differ in what we actually have people do as part of the obstacle course. But you could think of it like we would take in requirements, we would set up a series of digital interactions that a job seeker would go through so we can collect that data on, on motivation, on skill, on all of these other things that will predict will the person be able to do the job. 
And you, and you, and at a theoretical level, you could just think about it really quickly. Part of part of it is that we don't know how to assess, like look at these other data points to evaluate fit and and performance and quality. Part of it is we don't have those data points. So we want to create the most efficient way to collect the data points. And then we're in the process of figuring out how to use it. So a candidate will come through a customized chat bot where they'll kind of have a WhatsApp style exchange that gives us information and lets us screen people in or out or weight them based on things like location preferences, salary expectations, um, specific bits of experience, all the stuff that you would try to interpret from a pile of CVs, but you don't want a human being to do, or that you'd have to call someone and collect. All that comes through the chat bot. And then you mentioned kind of coding tests. We, we have assembled ourselves a library of 1300 or so mini assessments that try to get at those work samples outside of the context of just tech hiring. Um, so if it's a finance role, actually give spreadsheets and let people pull numbers out and, 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 and show that they know how to work with different financial concepts. Marketing, same thing in marketing. Data, maybe we actually have them type in a line of Python code, or maybe we have them pick which, which chart best visualizes a, a particular data point that we're looking to show. Um, our basic attitude is if we have a way to get past having people tell us what, they do, they, what they've done in the past to showing us what they could do in the future, that's gonna be better. Mm -hmm. So people will come through those and we customize that based on every role. And, and part of the IP that we've built over the last two and a half years is making it really easy to customize. So it doesn't, doesn't take long. You don't have to be a fancy psychologist to do that. Um, we also have voice interviews. So you can actually hear a candidate speak or a video interview so they can upload a, a video of themselves. All this based on what the employer actually wants. And then we built the technology that makes it really easy for employers to set role, rules, to screen people in and out, and to look at these candidates and decide who do they want to spend precious time interviewing. Um, that's been how the, the tech platform has been built. How we've actually used that to help companies is in different ways. Sometimes we license the tech platform, like a technology licensing business. Other times we use the technology ourselves and present more of a human face to our companies. So we're more of a service provider using technology on the back end to, to speed things along, um, but then still working more as a partner to these small companies. Um, so I just want to take a break and see, we've got people listening. We'd love to hear questions or comments. So at any time, we don't want to just be the two of us talking. So anytime, please put in your chat box. You can also click on your screen, turn on your video and your mic, and if you want to voice a question, so you know, no pressure, but we, we'd love to hear, you know, if Christy, if you have any questions from what students at Villanova are struggling with, and she just put a question as I said that. Um, so Christy said, well -timed. I'm, I'm joining because of my experience, social impact and nonprofit employers recruit very differently from other sectors. Um, she, she's saying financial services tech all look at similar platforms and applicant tracking systems where you can collect the candidate data, perform assessments. Public sector, or I guess your question is public sector employers often don't have the money or capacity for online recruiting platforms. What do you suggest to them? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think part of when we were starting this business, my co-founder Simon and I initially didn't want to start a business. Initially, we wanted to find somebody else who we could recommend to our companies. So we actually went to Silicon Valley, US, uh, uh, various markets to look at the technology that was being built for other people and realized that while there is some very interesting stuff happening around the world, most of it was built for very big corporations or very sophisticated companies with big budgets and very reliable big tech behind it. Uh, at, at minimum, a very reliable high-speed internet uh, um, line, which is not something you can take for granted in the markets that we work in. Um, and so this question highlights the fact that there are some similar platforms uh, in other markets. Um, ATSs are applicant tracking systems, which is something that big companies often have. We realized pretty quickly that um, not only today do small companies not have those uh, in place, but they're often completely in inaccessible based on how they're structured as offerings, how they're priced, which is often uh, very high priced, and the usability. Um, you often, for like there are assessment companies, for example, but the assessment companies often, you would need a full-time industrial organizational IO psychologist just to interpret what's going on. 
or there's tech options, but then you need a really robust IT department to be able to figure out how to integrate all these together. What we've tried to do is build a set of world-class technology tools that make it really easy to hire, but that is accessible and priced to anyone. Because our passion and our reason for existing is, is really to support SMEs more so than, than major corporates. Um, and so we do that by giving options to engage with us that don't require you to deal with technology at all. If somebody literally wants to just speak to one someone on our phone, there are ways to engage with us that you would just tell us what you need by phone and have your dream candidates magically sent to you uh, via e email uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so injecting that human touch. Um, we price this in ways that's very variableized and requires no uh, um, uh, like long-term commitment or big big technical integration. Um, and then we just try to keep it, to be very honest, very, very uh, affordable and, and cheap. Um, and I think we're now in a place that in the markets we work in, which is almost exclusively Kenya and India, um, probably 90 plus percent of our, of our uh, uh, clients are, are less than 200 employees. Um, and and uh, I think we found a, a way to support and bring some of these tools to these markets and these companies that won't break their bank, that are still uh, very much within their budgets. But it's a great question. Um, so the, another question came in from Farah from Germany, but I want to ask a question first. So one of the things you've said both in the webinar and in your writing online is the importance of trying to work to avoid bias in hiring. And so we know there's both implicit and explicit bias, you know, part of the credentials, geographic location, race, gender. Um, so through this process, are you, are you confident that you can help the employers or if you're hiring for shortlist itself? Like that you reduce bias. Like how do you how do you evaluate that the candidate, the final candidate pool, and the one who's hired, you know, like it's really based yeah. on, on the skills, and it's not on all these other factors. I, it, there's no question that a big motivation for us getting this company started was to try to reduce bias, particularly at the top of the recruiting funnel. Um, I think one of the one of the things that's crazy, that's probably not surprising when you think about it, but if you post a job, and many of these jobs will have 500 to 1,000 or more applicants, when you try to go through those CVs, your, your analytical part of your brain essentially shuts off. And you are resorting to heuristics that let you just triage this pile of resumes as quickly as possible. And I think that there's, there's bias, um, there's discrimination, um, implicit, explicit, at many points in the process, but one of the most hard to weed out and invisible is at the top of the funnel where applications come in and no one really is double checking to see why applications are getting rejected. Um, our hope is that if we can create a more objective and competency-based way of doing it at the top of the funnel, that this will actually be a lot um, um, better for uh, whether it's different genders or just different races applying, uh, applying to jobs. and. We are actually seeing research to suggest that that is true. We had a, a student group come in from a major university last year to start to look at, is this having an impact on, uh, on, on bias and who's applying to jobs and whether they make it through? And it seems like, yes. Um, certainly, we feel more confident in these kinds of automated rules-based approaches to, to recruiting than the current method, which... Uh, relies on an average resume review time of eight seconds each. And in eight seconds, really all you can do is look at, like, what can you tell from the person's name? Do you recognize the school? Do you recognize any of their employers? Does anything else just jump out to make you kind of subjectively like or dislike them? And then you move on to the next person. So we're definitely trying to uh, uh, improve upon that. We're also just hopeful that a more competency-based approach, one in which we are assessing for skills, will de-emphasize some of the things that get more attention typically in a process, which is kind of like how that interview goes, like the small talk, the, the, and that's where I think a lot of the bias um, lives. We're hoping if there's other data points as to actual ability, that those data points can be weighed a bit uh, more heavily. That said, there's a still a lot of work to be done, and what I'm talking about will not solve the uh, issues without more broad mindsets uh, being being shifted. Um, um, I, I love that there's efforts underway to, to to take closer looks at how we 
um, write job descriptions and the language that we use and certain job dis- I, I, I believe Amazon Amazon had had its own internal uh, uh, hiring technology tool that it actually shut down because it realized its job descriptions were being written in ways that were very masculine and alienating female applicants and and kind of uh, 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 advantaging male applicants and having some issues there. So I think there's a lot of work that we can still do to try to create a, a fairer uh, hiring process globally, but particularly in our markets. Great. Um, so just take a, a pause for a second. <clears throat> We've had a few more questions come in. So I'll ask Paul those, but feel free, put as many questions as you want. We'll try to cover as many as possible. And again, if you've got a longer comment or a question, or you just want to share some research, you can turn on your mic and video. You can send me a private message and I'll turn it on for you. So this question comes from Farah, who's based in Germany. She says, can you talk about trends in the social sector and what skills are most relevant? So I assume that, you know, that's, I assume that's more in kind of someone who's desiring to be hired. So, you know, for someone working and seeking to be employed in the social impact sector, social sector, basically what are the skills that they might want to focus on and what are the trends that are emerging? Yeah, I, I, it's a it, it's it's a it's a great question. Um, I think that uh, um, um, there's a number of different ways to ask answer it. One, I do think that across the board, whether you're in social or non-social companies, it's increasingly necessary to have those basic digital literacy skills in place. Obviously, how do you work on a computer and things like that? But more and more, coming at it with some awareness of how to. Uh, uh, understand, digest, analyze data is, is increasingly important. And so knowing how to write uh, SQL queries and, and knowing the basics of Python and R are, are coming up more and more across um, role functions. Understanding the basics of how digital marketing works is, is just absolutely essential. And that means being more uh, social media savvy. And it's amazing right now how uh, many p- young people I'm aware of have gotten their break into the social space because they can work a Twitter account and their bosses can't. Um, um, so I think there's like angles to, to add outsized value as young people coming into the space through social media awareness, understanding how Facebook uh, ads works, understanding how Google ads works. Um, and of course, engineering. I think that uh, some, some famous venture capitalists said not so long ago, in the future there'll be two types of jobs, those that tell machines what to do and those that go told what to do by machines. Mm -hmm. And I think it's increasingly important to be able to tell machines what to do. Um, So understanding the basics of product management, understanding the basics of engineering, I think are more and more important by the day across every sector. Um, With with careers in social impact in particular, I think it's a, um, um, a couple of things. I do think that the space has been generally in moving in a direction, has probably officially moved in the direction of wanting new entrants into this space to come ready to do basics in, in whatever profession or within whatever function they're doing. So people who are coming out of management consulting or some sort of banking or some sort of technical role seem to be at an advantage, not because there's any in, in inherent belief that that's a better or higher use of your brain, more because that's the part of the of your your professional skill set that most social sector organizations won't have budgets or abilities to train you on. So getting that somewhere else before you enter the social sector, I think, is is really important. Um, it, it because particularly because there does seem to be a healthy amount of competition for at least the best jobs in the social sector space. Um, Coming with that uh, pre, uh, pre pre built skill set, I think, is really important. And then, of course, having a really good um, I would I would call it more important for you as a young professional self awareness about why you're getting into the space, what your personal passion is, what your personal uh, mission is. I mean these these jobs um, these jobs are hard uh, and and can be and can be real really tough. And I've known many people who romanticize a certain notion of what it means to work in this space, but then they actually get into it, and realize what it is, and it's not right. So doing that self work ahead of time to understand what what drives you to get in, into this it's going to lead to more happiness on your side and being able to articulate that narrative to an employer as you're trying to convince them that that you're really in this for the right reasons and will be here uh, for the long term i think is is really valuable and important 
Um, so if three more questions have come in, I'm going to just squeeze in one question. And I'm, I can go on forever, but I want to hear from the audience. But the one question is, so going through this process where you have kind of competency-based, you know, some automation, some human touch, you know, a, a lot of new hires fail. You know, some people say 50% of all new hires fail like in the first year or two, which is a huge you know, loss, both in terms of cost to the employer, frustration on the, the employee end. I mean, I've, I've had jobs I've started they didn't stay in. Um, so can you say, going through this process, that if someone's hiring, whether it's you or one of your the employers you support, that candidates, not, not only is it a better match, but they do stay, I mean, millennials may not stay as long, but they do stay in the job longer and there's more happiness on both sides. Do you have any data to show that or any? At this point, it's still very anecdotal, but it's positive. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly our hope. When we make the case to an employer, why, why should you use shortlist? There's kind of two elements to that. One is the efficiency argument, which is just, hey, we're going to save you time. We're going to get you to approximately the same outcome, but we're going to save you time and money and effort and all that kind of stuff. There's also, though, the quality argument that like we're going to actually get you better people, better people, meaning they're going to perform in different ways, maybe productivity benefits or things like that. They're going to be happier. They're going to stick around longer. So retention will be higher. And we're collecting that data as we speak. It's too early to say we have definitive data, but anecdotally and, and as best we can tell, um, yes, hiring in this way both gets you better people, but it also gets you people that are more motivated to do the job. One of the nice things is of, of putting in a, an obstacle course, some, certain people opt out, right? They say, hey, I don't want to do this. This application's harder than clicking a button. Um, I'm out. But the people that do stick around, it's kind of a test of, is this something you're actually interested in? And it lets them self-select into the role because in going through the, the, the skills challenges, they're actually getting, a, a, you know, not perfect, but a taste of what is this job that I'm applying for? Do Am I interested in this or not? Um, and so I think that, uh, um, that, that, that both measure of ability, but also the self-selection and the motivation or interest test um, we do think is going to, uh, over time, yield um, better results in terms of fit, direct, retention, all of those other factors. Um, one other quick question, then I'll get to Christy. As you know, we're part of this Collaboration for Talent initiative you know, from Ashoka, trying to change recruiting in, in the social sector. You know, it's been an interesting experiment with about 10 other organizations. So one of the dreams of Collaboration for Talent and others is, you know, often you apply for a job, you don't get it or you get it, but like you know, a hundred other people who applied, they, they just disappear. And so does your system have anything, let's say you get 300 applicants, you know, and 50 or let's say 20 make it through all the competency-based testing. Does it have any ranking? Like, and only one or two people might get the job. For the, for the other top candidates, does your system keep them in some line that when other positions come up where they've already passed the competency, they, they like jump the queue and, or like, it, is it, does it build a history of the candidates who are applying? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's where we're investing a lot in terms of the future of our business is um, how do we how do we take these relationships that we've built with job seekers, take this unique data we have, data that goes beyond obviously their CV, but gets into their skills, their interests, and use that to match them with great jobs. And that's one of our early realizations and almost frustrations that we would do these great searches for a role. We would find 20 phenomenal people to shortlist for the role. Um, one person would get hired and that's great. We solved our client's um, issue, but now we've got 19 other people who we spent a lot of time getting to know what do we do with them. We are starting to see a lot more interchangeability, improvements to how our recommendation engine works so that once someone uh, let's say they don't get one job, how do we make sure we're recommending the right jobs to them going forward? How do we make sure those job seekers are showing up in the searches of other clients that we're working with? Um, and, and, and we're already seeing that the majority of the people that we place uh, into roles and that we shortlist for roles are coming from our internal database at this point, as opposed to just like, applying through LinkedIn or some other external source um, each time. So we're, we're hoping to create this kind of closed ecosystem of, of, of really terrific talent in these markets who we can be more actively um, supporting. So, so just for anyone who's watching and thinking about applying for jobs, either at shortlist or on shortlist, so that gives you a little bit of encouragement, like you are not gonna, if you feel qualified, if you go through the obstacle course and it takes an hour or two hours or whatever it takes, 
like you're not wasting your time if you don't get the job you're applying for. So that, I mean, that, that's really, because as you're saying, a lot of other times you're, you're throwing your resume at the wall yeah. and all this effort, you know, writing whatever it is. And, and after that is done, you either get it or you don't. And there's, there's no, there's no follow-up. So this is really trying to improve the experience on both ends. Yep. Um, so Christy has a question. Do you think there will be more entry-level jobs in CSR, corporate social responsibility, impact investing that will open for students with only an undergraduate degree? Because she writes that it seems like a lot of these positions are only open for mid to senior level executives. I don't know. Um, I feel reasonably confident that we are, that, that CSR and finding market-based approaches to how we solve big global challenges is on the rise. And it's getting there. There are there is more demand for talent in that space than less. So I think that is an encouraging trend and a great reason to get into this field if you're interested into it or to stay in it if if you're already already here. Um, I, I don't know specifically about entry level or not. I'm aware that a lot of the companies that uh, have CSR groups, they use those groups as kind of a carrot or an incentive or, or a mini bonus that they can offer to longstanding employees who are looking to do something different, um, um, who can br then import kind of the corporate DNA into CSR, but, 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 uh, but, and, and uh, have those skills to go do it. So I don't, I, I don't know for sure whether there's more opportunities in undergrad, but um, um, certainly across the board, I anticipate there will be more, more jobs generally in CSR impact investing um, market-based solutions to, to poverty and other global social uh, problems. Okay. Um, thanks. We have four more questions that came in and I also just shared a report with everyone that RippleWorks did about a year and a half, two years ago, kind of on the human capital talent deficit in the social sector. So for people who may not know, RippleWorks got funding from Ripple cryptocurrency, and they're doing a lot of innovation research um, in the social sector. So it's, it's a great report to read, um, not, not focused specifically in India and Kenya, I think it's more North America focused, but they, they talk about some of the challenges and the sectors where more talent's needed. Um, so we have a question from Anjum, I think Anjum's the one from India who's an Imani fellow. Um, so he says, He's interested in hearing any, hearing about, are you tracking any metrics to measure shifts in hiring in any emerging trends? I think we've talked about that some, but you know, how, how is hiring changing in the social sector and any, what, what metrics are you using, this, both in terms of developing clients for shortlist, but in general, like, and part of that might be like, you, have, you said you have the 1300 different kind of permutations of how you can test for competency. So like, what are, what are the new areas you're looking to test based on what's coming up? I, I think that uh, um, um, there, there's a lot of different things happening. Obviously, there's there's uh, new skills that have never really been tested before, um, and that have uh, that are really new in this in in these markets. Um, new tech platforms are being built as fast as. Uh, um, as 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 you can learn them. I know that our 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 tech platform. We built our initial tech platform on. Uh, um, this this framework that came out of Google called Angular. I mean, we were like on Angular two uh, two years ago. Um, uh, we are now on Angular six, and even the whole idea of Angular, if you asked a developer from five years ago, that I don't even think that existed, or at least it existed in a totally rudimentary form. And so I think the speed with which the actual techno technical requirements are changing means it's not as useful anymore to depend entirely on. Uh, uh, on on like s specific skills assessments, keywords, and in fact, you're you're starting to see the resumes are just becoming jumbles of keyword, particularly in technical space. I think that what we're now starting to look at more and more are what are those super skills or those meta skills that overlay um, success in multiple areas, particularly against the backdrop of a very volatile, changing world. These these VUCA worlds that we. Uh, um, um, talk about volatile, uncertain, complex, mm -hmm. ambiguous. I can't even remember what it stands for, but something something like that. Um, so what are some of those super skills? And I don't think we've figured out the way to test for them, but we're always looking for ways to, to get at these, certainly ability to learn and how quickly uh, learning velocity is more and more and more important. Um, resilience and grit. 
um, becomes much more important that uh, even if things are challenging, you don't get discouraged and you keep pushing through. Having a growth mindset, um, which is kind of like optimism, but it's, it's, it's more about whether you view yourself as, as impacting the world, as an agent of change in the world, or whether kind of the world happens to you. Um, there's these different, uh, I think, super skills that are becoming more and more talked about as the things that are setting apart people from, who succeed in the modern workplace from people who might fall a bit behind. From our side, we're also, at Shortlist, we're also interested in training for these, because I don't, I don't think any of these are unlearnable. Um, we, uh, um, one of the things we realized about a year ago was that for us to have our maximum impact in the world, we couldn't just be sorting good people from bad people. We had to find some way that we can more proactively help the workforce in the markets that we work in. As an early experiment, we merged with a soft skills training business called Spire last year in Kenya. Spire has been doing both direct uh, job seeker facing, young professionals facing trainings, as well as corporate trainings, but all around soft skills. So communication and productivity and leadership and mindsets and all of these things that um, aren't about doing one specific thing well, like programming or, or technical finance, but more about how you approach your work, how you pr approach working in teams, all of these things that are lowest common denominators across functions and industries at the moment. And I think that that is, that is increasingly true in all sectors, including social. Okay. Um, so a couple more questions, and some of these are very specific, so we can kind of draw out the broader question. Um, so one is from Britt from University of San Diego, the Kroc School. So her comment, there's not, there's not many career fairs that come to her school, focus on social sector. So how did, what's the best way to break into the field? Do you just like get in a bunch of listservs? So I think the general question is if you're not located in a global hub, or you know, main city in Kenya or India, and you're trying to break into this sector, and maybe you're at you're at a good university, but just not the right location, or you're not at a university. Like, how does what advice do you have for the individual? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different tracks, um, and I, I, I it's it, I would be the first to admit that it's not immediately clear always how to get into this space, even if people um, want to. I'd say the same was true when I was trying to figure out my way. My way trying to get into this space was. Um, I, I wanted to get into microfinance, whatever, I don't even know what year it is, let's see, to a, about 13, 14 years ago. Um, and uh, I, I ended up just writing letters to probably 50 different microfinance institutions, um, uh, uh, letters, emails. I don't think I got one single response um, and ultimately got into this space by kind of throwing myself at the mercy of this one microfinance um, entrepreneur and and just begging him to come work and um, not only would he not pay me for four months he, i remember him in fact saying he's like look i will let you in the first day i don't really like interns i think they generally are a waste of time and distraction i will let you in the first day we're not giving you a computer we're not giving you a place to sit um, and i'm not going to give you anything to do but if you find a way to add value when you show up here you're happy you know we'll keep opening the door for you um, and you can keep coming to work. That was essentially how I got into microfinance. Um, so so I, I don't know if it's better or worse than those days, but I think it's still challenging. Um, couple of tracks. Um, one, I do think there's, if, if, if you have the resources or ability or wherewithal, there's still no option like just showing up in a market you want to work in and talking to people. I think if, if particularly for emerging markets uh, work, um, people don't believe that you're really going to show up until you're there sitting in front of their face. So get on an airplane, show up in wherever you want to be, like India, where, where I've worked, show up in Hyderabad, show up in Mumbai, get in front of people, ask them what problems they're trying to solve as organizations and come up with ideas and how you might be able to help solve them and talk your way into a job. And you're probably not gonna earn any money to start or it's gonna be very little, but that changes. And I still think most of the people that I think have been most successful as peers in this space have some origin story that's kind of like that. I think there are more on-ramps. Um, unfortunately, some of these have like closed a little bit, but I, I teach for a couple of programs, um, one called the uh, uh, Monterey uh, Frontier Market Scouts, program, the other one, um, uh, Impact Business Leaders. Both are going through a bit of a reshuffle. I'm not sure how much they're still being taught at present, but um, they existed for this kind of application of how do I get a transition into the field, learn some content in the classroom, but mostly focus on finding a real world opportunity to get my 
um, hands dirty. Um, and then I do think that uh, um, um, I'm hoping platforms like Shortlist can help. So at minimum, people should come check out the jobs that, that exist on Shortlist. Interestingly, a lot of our, not a lot, but a, an actual number uh, or percentage of our employers are specifically looking for um, talent from overseas for different reasons. Lots of it coming from needing to report to um, foreign uh, uh, investors or um, sell to foreign buyers. Um, so hopefully an, a platform like Shortlist is making it easier for companies to access that talent and vice versa, but it is still early. But, but hopefully Shortlist will be doing more of this in the future. Great, um, and just to say we have two Amani fellows watching. Um, I'm on the advisor yeah. of Amani. Great. They started a great place in the, right now in India, Brazil, and Kenya. Um, and there are lots of other things, and you can do a lot. We talk a lot about this in PCM. You can also find a lot of free stuff, Acumen Plus or Philanthropy University. Like, there, there's no excuse, I mean, unless you're like so busy keeping your family and life like the amount of time. But you, there's so many creative ways to learn. Some do cost, some don't cost. Um, so next question is from Robin, again, it's specific. Any advice for some, and Robin, let us know where you're calling in from, you know, what place we'd like to get a sense of geography. Um, so any advice for someone with a marketing, public relations, and MS, in international business who wants to get into marine conservation or other social impact organizations. So I think it's, I think it's a similar kind of question, not geographic, but someone who's got some skills, got a degree, and wants to, sounds like maybe not that much work experience, where do they start? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a lot like the last question. Um, I'm probably no substitute for getting in front of these uh, organizations and um, trying to find an opportunity to do some work, even if it's not in a um, well-compensated um, manner. I, I, the personal strategy that I've recommended and used myself um, has, is often what I suggested before, which is go into these conversations, <laughs> don't immediately jump towards to the, what jobs do you have? But instead, jump into what problems, you, let's set aside jobs, ignore that. I, I'm just assume nobody ever actually has published jobs with budget that they're ready to hire. And it happens every once in a while, but you can't count on it. What you will usually find, though, is an organization that if they had another smart person, they wish they could solve X, Y, Z. And if you start to get people talking about that, and it's something you're interested in, I, I built a personal uh, independent consulting practice, basically just trying to help companies solve these strategic projects, where I would say, great, like, here's what I'm hearing as your challenge. Why don't I work with you um, on this? Here's what I can do. I will just blend easily into the company. I'm not, we're not going to scope this in some big way. I'll just start working on it. And usually I would start working on it for free. And I would just start, I would spend a little bit of time to say, hey, how about you introduce me to the three people on your team that are doing that? Let me have a, a couple conversations. Let me come back with some ideas. I do that for free, maybe have a bit of follow up. Um, and hopefully, and it didn't always happen, but it actually happened more often than not, that eventually some budget would get freed up to pay me something. To, to help out for a while longer. And occasionally that could have turned into a full-time position if I'd wanted it to, or at least it created a way for me to get exposure to the opportunity, build up a bit of a resume. In some cases, earn a little bit. In other cases, really not earn anything, but um, get to do that work and build up a bit of a track record, some, some network. I feel like if you do that well, you do it a few times, this is such a small sector and people are so willing to help People are so eager to have more talented individuals working on these issues in this space that those will often create a, a, a nice little virtuous cycle where and knock on effects where you'll get bounced around to other people introduced. Um, and I've, I know many careers have kind of started in that in that basic way. Thanks. I'm sure about eight minutes left. Um, Robin's calling in from Michigan and she also has a follow-up question about volunteering. So the answer is yes, but don't just do blind volunteering and also, there's a lot of fellowships out there, Atlas, Core, Acumen. You know, there's so many social impact fellowship programs now for all stages of careers. So sometimes you can do it by not doing free work, but actually getting some compensation to build your skills. Um, Moving World is another great organization. Like, I mean, email me directly or look on PCM. There's tons of resources about how to, you know, and if you're at university, we can talk forever what skills you should develop and use your career center. Um, so another question is, how do you actually show soft skills or growth mindset or resilience on the CV so, or on your LinkedIn profile? Because like, what people tend to list, you know, if someone's not using shortlist or employer's not using it and they're recruiting, like, how do you show these things like in the written form? I don't, I don't, if someone 
has a good answer to this, let me know. I don't know a good way to show it in the written form. The only way I know how to show it is, is in behavior. And the, the kind of the meta process underneath every recruiting process is, is, is where that might come out. So um, your, 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 your CV might look the same, but where you might show resilience or proactivity or, or, or an ability to get stuff done will be how you figure, like I've, I've had, how you figure out ways to engage and show your commitment and interest beyond just the, the, the process. If you happen to have a network and you're able to have people put in good words for you, that's, that's, that's great. And it shows that you know how to apply leverage or influence um, in different ways. If you don't have that, trying to do a little research to find out who, who is behind the hiring process, who's actually making the decision. I don't think it ever works out just to sell, to send long, um, emails that are like, I'm amazing, you should hire me, and getting aggressive. But I do think it's an opportunity to show your ability to add value. Um, when, I was, when I was running my, my small impact fund, um, Axiom Venture Lab, the, I, I think two of the uh, investment officers that I ended up hiring were not people I was initially chasing after, but were people that, that were just very repeatedly diligent and thoughtful about sending me companies I might be interested to invest in, with thoughtful analyses. So rather than send me an email that just said, hey, I'm amazing, let me tell you about my CV again and how amazing I am, they skipped that, they didn't even do that, they just said, hey, I don't know if you've come across these five companies yet, but I met them recently, here's the list, here's what I like about them, here's what I don't like about them, I took down the founder's name, if you'd like an intro, let me know. That is remarkably effective and lets me see what the person could do, lets me, gets me reading the email. I think I called those people back up. I was like, actually, I knew three of those. I didn't know two of those. That's very interesting. Let's talk about them. What did you think? And then eventually it leads to getting hired. So finding ways to demonstrate those meta skills through the process, finding opportunities to add value to the, to the group you're trying to, to work with, whether that's through uh, targeted volunteering, whether that's through um, appropriate, helpful engagement. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's uh, important. Um, as much as we are trying to create a fairer job application process, it's still not a fair process. And so you still should, when, when reasonable, take it upon yourself to, to go the extra mile for those things you really want. Um, don't trust that like the best, the best applicant will rise to the top. Unfortunately, we're trying to fix it, but we're not there yet. Um, it's still a great idea for those opportunities you're most excited about. Really go for them. I'm sure about six minutes left. Any questions, please send them coming. Um, so one question just about shortlist in general. Can you tell us a little about the scope in terms of how many employees you have, what areas you might be hiring directly, and where you, you like, what are your, What's your vision or ambition for expanding? So are you staying in India and Kenya? Or are you coming to Colombia? You know, where I am? Or kind of, you know, what, what do you hope to achieve in the next few years, both in terms of impact and kind of scale? Yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy ride for us already. So we started, started Shortlist in, in 2016. Um, we, we've now worked with 300 companies. Um, we've, we've screened half a million candidates. We've um, uh, um, grown to a team of almost 60 now, which is kind of crazy for me to think about. Um, um, but still just see huge opportunity um, ahead. Uh, hiring is one of those things that whether you're a social organization or not, everyone needs to do it. Almost every company can do it better than they are today. Um, and they're st we're just at the starting point of how technology can be used to improve that. Um, so I think we've got a lot of work to do in our core markets. We are very much in our core markets, like I said, trying to think about how we can more productively engage with uh, job seekers in the market. So great, we're going to keep on trying to help companies hire. We also, like I said, want to do more on the training side and generally help young professionals get the most out of their career and help them access career ideas and career pathways um, so they can uh, unlock their professional potential. We're thinking about market expansion, so we'll, we'll be targeting for the moment probably Sub-Saharan Africa, but we are thinking about some markets um, in Asia, in the U.S. We would love to come to Latin America, although it's probably still um, uh, at least 18 months away, but it is something that is in our sights um, um, someday. And then, of course, just continuing to, to build out our team, um, the team of people who actually run these searches. So a lot of the headcount that we have today are people that actually just 
do the real work of engaging with companies, helping them understand what, who they're looking to hire, helping them use our platform, but actually in many times um, running these searches and engaging with the employers, engaging with the candidates, finding the right fit, and making sure that we are applying the right amount of human touch and support to get to the result they want. So we're hiring across operations functions like that. We're hiring for sales, um, also building out the data and the, the product team. So um, really, really growing in a lot of directions at once at the moment, which makes it exciting. And from the business perspective, two questions, and then we'll end up with one last question. So can you talk about what it means to run a distributed global team or help run that? You know, because that, is that the future of work and do your staff have to be located in India and Kenya, like the core 60, or they can be all over the world? And then just a little bit from the business perspective, are you bootstrapping? Do you have investment? And just, you know, some people watching, maybe they're starting their own social enterprise or might, just any, any wisdom there. Yeah. So the, on the first one, um, we are somewhat distributed in the sense that we have three primary offices where um, almost, I think there might be one or two exceptions, but um, ev everyone sits between Hyderabad, which is our tech office, Mumbai, which is our front office, and Nairobi. As we expand into new markets, we are dedicated to building local teams in the countries that we serve. So we'll eventually expand, but we are not ready to take that leap to a fully distributed, everybody works from their living room in their slippers and uh, sleepwear. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, um, our view is that one of our competitive advantages and one of the things that we invest a lot in is culture, shared values, shared ways of working together, a really deep understanding uh, of each other as team and as people. I think that is much, much harder to build, not impossible, but much, much harder to build if you're not sharing the same space. And so while there are subtle variations across the dynamics uh, and, and uh, well, ways of working, work styles across the offices. We, we're really proud of the fact that we've built a shared cultural foundation across all the places, um, but it has its challenges. We spend a lot of time on Zoom. We are always experimenting with new um, speaker systems to make, make our conversations more realistic. So we've got a lot of work to do there. On the um, money side, um, we've been fortunate to both raise a little bit of grant money as well as we did one round of outside investment. Mm -hmm. um, we're currently doing another round of investment now and it's a long process as anyone knows who's gone through it. Um, so we're kind of right in the middle of, of that process. Um, and, and that's been great. I do think when people ask for advice, um, um, I think that there has been an unfortunate bias towards let's go fundraise. And I think that because that's more visible and people hear about these fundraise success stories, there's this mistaken assumption that the right way to start a business is come up with an idea, put it on a PowerPoint deck and start pitching. When in reality, many of the most successful businesses, many of which we probably haven't even heard of as, as people, but they're successfully employing people, making money, serving customers, have never taken outside capital. They have focused on building sustainable revenue models. They are profitable from day one, or they have found in other resources to support themselves through the initial investment period. Um, I know that we're kind of somewhere in the middle. We are gonna raise more money probably from outside investors. But we're also trying to focus on building a business that can be profitable and that can, that can grow in a, in a more stable way than some of these um, you know, high flying ones we read about on the front page of the paper where they, they may grow faster, but they also seem to crash more frequently than the, than the standard um, companies. So the last question is for 30 seconds. So how, for whoever's watching and when we put this online later, how can people engage so one, they can go to shortlist, look for who you're hiring for, they can look for the recruitment you're assisting other employers for, Follow you yep. on social media. You've got a good blog. I mean, any any other ways you want people to just yeah, um, go go to our blog, um, 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 uh, tw Twitter at uh, Shortlist Hires. Go to shortlist.net and and register. Um, even if you're not looking for a job, we are we are starting to more actively send around career content, um, uh, uh, newsletters, things like that. Uh, and reach out to me. I'm at Paul at Shortlist.net. Um, I'm try to be really accessible and responsive. Um, um, Twitter, Paul Breloff. Um, um, would love to would love to hear hear from folks. So thank you so much for sharing a full hour of your time. I know you're super busy and glad we had, I wish some people turned on their videos, but at least we had lots of questions from all over the world and I'm looking forward to see what is the next iteration and how Shortlist is going to keep growing and hopefully coming to Columbia and the U.S. and other places and have a great time in New York. And I'm not, we're both on the East Coast unusually, but 
I'm going to go back to Medellin on Friday. So thank you so great. much. Great. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for, for listening. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Um, Bye-bye. Thanks. I'm going to find the log off thing here.